Welcome to the Mountain Springs Fellowship Bible Church. As followers, we are nothing but sinners saved by grace, covered by the shed blood of Christ. Today, Pastor James talks about two paths that man can willfully choose. The road to redemption leads to grace through our faith. The other is the road to destruction, led by our pride and emotions. As he calls to each one of us, understand how to navigate your path and find your way back home. Join us now from the little church on the curve. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin are death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Think about that for a second. We're all sinners saved by grace. And that's the only way we have to be right standing before the Lord is, is through the grace of God, which is a free gift. It's not anything that costs you. Uh, it costs you nothing but your life. You're, you're willing to give that up to be like God, be in the presence of God, to be a uh, child of God. Genesis 3, we've studied the creation, how, why it was formed, why it was given, why God gave that to us as a first fruit offering to man, how man became disobedient to God and by, through pride, through the lust of the eyes, lust of flesh, boastful pride of life, chose for himself chose to uh, operate on emotions instead of operating on the Word of God. We'll see in Genesis 3.21 that life is in the blood. Look at Leviticus 17. Leviticus 17 verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. That if the wages of sin are death, What's the atonement? God asked for the sacrifice in Genesis 3.21. Look at Genesis 3.21. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife. That God provided a sacrifice. God provided an atonement. God provided a way to cover the shame, the nakedness of man. Remember that, that the problem that Adam and Eve had was they saw they were different. They saw the differences within themselves, and they, were, they had shame. They were naked. They knew that there was a difference, that they were no longer united as one in God, but now they were separated because of the differences of who they were. And they saw that, and they were naked, and they, so they hid themselves. And what's the first thing they do? They go jump right to, you know, what can I do to hide my shame? What can I do to hide my sin? What can I do to not be exposed. What can I do to hide from God? So they sewed fig leaves together. And God said, no. Well, those fig leaves just aren't going to do. That you can't make anything. You, man can't come to God. Man can't do anything to hide himself from God. God knows you. God sees you. God knows your heart. God knows everything about you. He knows more about you than you know about you. God knows you. And he said, no, these fig leaves aren't going aren't gonna to do so. He made, he allowed a sacrifice to occur. He took from the creation, which he called was very good. He said that creation was very good, that he took something good from that creation, something that was innocent, something that was sinless, something that had no, <laughs> no dog in the fight. He took from that, and he shed its blood to cover, to cover the sin and shame of man. Isn't that amazing? That's the foreshadowing of Jesus on our cross. That's the foreshadowing of the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That's what this is a foreshadowing of. It's a huge verse. And he did it for Adam and his wife. He didn't do it just for Adam. He didn't do it just for the wife. They were both guilty. He provided the covering. He clothed them. The flesh was corrupt, and he clothed them. That's what Genesis 3.21 means. That that's the foreshadowing of Jesus' death on the cross. In Genesis 3.21, I can do all these things to hide my differences. I can create all these false things in front of you to put this facade in front of you to hide my difference from you. But God wants you, God wants you to run naked through life. Through the shed covering of the blood of, cross, of Jesus. That's what he wants. He wants you to be transparent with one another. That's what's so beautiful about a fellowship. You can come here with a burden. You can come here with something heavy on your heart. You can come here with trouble. And you can speak to a brother, sister in Christ and not be judged. Not feel ashamed. 
not feel worried. I, look at, the, you know, I'm the chief of all sinners here. I keep telling you all that. I am the chief of all sinners here. Because I'm a sinner saved by grace, I'm a child of God's. Amen. I'm no longer a slave of fear. I've been redeemed. You know, the fig leaf is temporal. Its covering is by man. It's not sufficient. God had to provide a sacrifice. That is what's so important about Genesis 3.21, is God has to provide. Genesis 3.22, Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become... I used to read, watch this, I used to read this, the man has become like us. And then I looked, and this is like one of us. That man has become fearful, <laughs> disobedient, and prideful. He's like, become like one of us. He's not become like God. He hasn't become like the Trinity, like the devil said he would. He hasn't become God himself. He just knows good and evil. He just now has the ability to, work, to operate on his fears or his faith. That he has the ability to be uh, driven by his emotions or by wisdom of God. That's what man now has the ability to do. That he has the ability to do that. But watch this. And now he might stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life. That he may take also from that tree of life. That he's got that tree of knowledge of good and evil that he's eaten from. And now he might live forever eating from the tree of life. Isn't that amazing? God doesn't want you to live forever in a fallen state. God doesn't want you to live forever by faith alone. He wants you to again be reunited with Him. That He wants you again, for you to be again in His presence. Isn't that amazing? That God's desire is for you to be in His presence, so He gave you a number of years to live in a fallen state, so that by faith you can return to Him and be once again in His kingdom. He doesn't want you to live forever in a fallen state. You know, we mourn the loss of our loved ones. We mourn that loss of being around them, being with them, being together with them, holding their hand, uh, talking with them. We mourn that loss. It's a tough loss. There's, there's nothing easy about it. But we rejoice that they are in the presence of God. We rejoice of what their position is. We rejoice as to what they've achieved, where they're at in life. They're in an eternal life, an eternal state with God in the presence of the, God. The second they quit breathing this air on this earth. That we can live a life here on earth by faith. And know that by faith we too, we too will pass from this earth to be again, once again in the presence of God. That's what we live by faith by. That's our hope. Our hope is in who we are in God. Our hope is in the returning of the King, the returning of the Lord. That's our hope. We are in a fallen state. You are in a fallen state right now. Like, uh, you know, my son, he's 18, and so he's like, you know, I could live forever. But, you know, the older you get, when you get in your 50s, you're like, huh, a little harder to live forever. In your 60s, even harder, 70s, 80s. It gets harder the older you get. You're like, Lord, take me home. Lord, take me home. This body hurts. I want that body you've promised me. And don't lose sight on that. It's a promise. It's a promise from this point forward. Watch this promise. This is so important. Please don't miss this. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. God scooped from the dust of the ground and blew life into man. Then he planted a garden. He's made something special and placed man in that. Watch what it says here. That God took you out of paradise and put you to live in this world for what purpose? So that you may cultivate and grow. You can cultivate your faith. You can grow in the Lord. You can become a child of God. You can return to Him. God gave life to everyone. That life in the garden is only through the shed blood of Christ now. It's only through the shed blood of Christ that we can return to the garden. Isn't that amazing? That God took from the ground... Do you see that? Do you see that in that verse? Do you see the two places here in that verse that you have the place that God that you're with God in paradise and you can no longer be with God in paradise so now you're within the world that where you're at here te is temporal that you're going to return to dust. But God gives you a promise of a, of this new place. Watch this. So he drove the man out. God drove the man out. The man didn't want to leave. He went kicking and screaming. 
He's in this beautiful, lush paradise. He's in, he's in the house that God prepared with many, many rooms. He's been thrown out. He's been drove out. He was forced to leave. God drove the man out. And at the east end of the garden. Why on the east end of the garden? Where does the sun rise? When you see the sun rise, do you have not a hope for a new day? Do you not have hope watching the sun rise? On the east end of the garden. There's so much meaning in these, in these last few verses. He stationed two angels, two cherubim, in the flaming sword, which turns every direction, to guard the way to the tree of life. This is an act of mercy. This is an act of mercy and a promise that with redemption, there's a way back. Listen, watch what he did. He guarded that entrance. That means that you can get back to it. He guarded that entrance, which means you want to get back to it. He guarded that entrance because it's a desire for man to be with God in his house, in his place. But God had to guard that away from man. What did he guard it with? He guarded it with holiness. Two angels. He guarded it with his holiness. That this is a holy place to enter. And he's guarding, but, but what, what else is he guarding with? He's guarding with a flaming sword. How do we see Jesus coming back again? He's got a flaming sword coming. What's the flaming sword represent? Anybody know? Word of God, right? So by the word of God, knowing who he is, the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword, right? It's able to cut deep to bone and marrow. By the word of God, we can come to the holy place. And we can become holy just as he is holy. We can become holy, enter back into the garden. You see that? That's a promise. I'm just simply amazed that God has provided a way back and it's only guarded. He's not saying you can't come back. He's only guarded the place because you have to come back on whose terms? 100% God's terms. That's why we have the story of Cain and Abel. Do you know that is why Cain and Abel's story is in place? So that you can see the past of two men? So that you can see what it takes to get your way back to the garden? That you have a decision to make, you have a choice to make, you now have been, been afforded the, the knowledge of good and evil, you can now choose to run on your emotions or you can choose to run on your faith, that you can choose to, to dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness, or you can run on your emotions and let your emotions drive your life. Watch this, chapter 4, verse 1 in uh, Genesis. Now the man had relations with his wife Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain. Cain was the firstborn male child. She said, I have gotten a man-child with the help of the Lord. This is her firstborn male child. Do we know if there's any female children living at this time? Got no idea. Who knows? We don't know. They're only going to tell us about Cain and Abel. That Cain was born the first male child. That first male child with all the birthrights. And then she gave birth to his, to her, his brother Abel. We don't know if there was children born between Cain and Abel. We have no idea. What God wants us to know is about Cain and Abel. We do know that Abel was the keeper of the flocks, that he was somewhat of a shepherd, that he was, he was the leader of the, of the sheep, that he was a, a priest of some sort. Let me show you what Jesus says about him. Look at Luke 11. It's very important for you to see what Jesus says about Abel. Luke 11, starting in about verse 49. Jesus is talking to some lawyers and, and some teachers. But in verse 49, he says, For this reason... Also the, the wisdom of God said, I will send to them prophets and apostles, and some of them they will kill, and some they will persecute. So that the blood of all the prophets shed since the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation. From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah. Jesus saw Abel as a prophet. So Abel had a purpose. Abel had a, a position. Abel had a job. He was the keeper of the flock. Of what flock? The lamb. The, the flock. The, hey, listen, they didn't eat meat then, did they? So he wasn't, he wasn't raising beef. He was raising lamb. Why lamb? Because what was that herd for? Well, it was for sacrifice. That's the only use that, came, that Adam and Eve saw with, for a lamb. It wasn't for food. It was for sacrifice. But Cain was a tiller of the ground. Look at Jude 11. This is the way that the New Testament Jude, the brother of Jesus, saw Cain. Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain. He's talking about all the sinners, all the people who have fallen away from God, all the people who live by fear and not by faith, all the people that live their life based on emotion, all the people who have turned away from God. They've gone the way of Cain. 
that you either have the way of Cain or you have the way of Abel in this verse, that there's two paths that you can take in life. Verse 3 in Genesis 4-3. Uh, We're going to fast forward about 100 years. 100 years? Yeah, I'm going to fast forward about 100 years. Why did I say 100 years? Hold your finger there. Look at chapter 5, verse 3. How old was Adam when Seth was born? He was 130 years old. It says right there in that, that verse. We know that Seth was born right after uh, Abel was slayed. It says, when Adam lived 130 years, he became the father of a son, and his own likes according to his own image, and named him Seth. It says in Genesis 4 that Seth was born right after the death of Abel. So we know this is about 100 years. So how many people are on the earth in this 100 years? How many people have populated the earth in that 100-year time? If you're a 70-year-old a man and you've got kids, grandkids, great-grandkids, you've got a lot of kids. I mean, your, your, your clan could get up to 50, 60, 70, 80, 100 people. No, without any doubt. You can have a large clan of people, and those people have people. So we have a large population. So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. That Cain decided, you know what, I'm just going to gather up some fruit here. And you know what, God, I know the offering's supposed to be the shed blood. I know that the offering to the, to, on the altar of the Lord is about the blood. I know this, God, but I'm tired of that. I don't want to do that. I want to do it my way. I'm going to bring you my, my fruit of the ground. Because that's what I do. I'm a farmer. I'm not a, I'm not a rancher. I'm a farmer. I'm bringing my fruits. No. Verse 4. Abel, on his part, also brought the firstlings of his flock and the, their fat portions. Abel brought the firstlings. He brought the firstlings of his herd. The, the firstborn. He didn't worry about whether or not any more were going to be born. He brought the firstlings, the first fruits of his herd. He brought those to the Lord. Not only that, we know that he brought them sacrifice because he brought the fat portions. So we know that Abel brought the best that he could give. He brought that best before God. We know that by the way, what it says here. That Cain was just going, yeah, here you go, God. It's what I got for you. And Abel was reverent and honoring and pleasing to the Lord that he was doing what he was commanded to do to bring the, the shed blood of the animal for the offering. Of sacrifice the wages of sin is death that without the blood there is no sacrifice look at hebrew 9 verse 22 and according to the law one may also say all things are cleansed with blood and without shedding of blood there is no forgiveness you see that's how important the offering is to god that it, that offering hasn't changed that offering today hasn't changed we are saved, we are hidden by the blood of Christ. By the shed blood of Christ, by the blood of the Lamb on the cross, we have been saved. That, we, that God's wrath has been satisfied by that. Isn't that amazing? Look at verse 11 in Hebrews. But when Christ appeared as a high priest uh, of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more important tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of the goats and calves, but through his own blood, he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Having attained eternal redemption. That your redemption is through the blood of the cross. Watch what he's doing for Cain and Abel. It's no different. Their redemption is through the blood sacrifice that they're giving the first fruits of their offering. That there's a first fruit offering. God gave man. His first fruit offering was the creation. In the beginning, God created heavens and earth. That was his first fruit offering to man. Man blew it. Man fell. Wages of sin or death. In verse 4, he says, And then the, and the Lord had regard... He accepted, he regarded Abel for his offering. He was pleased with that. But for Cain, his offering, he had no regard. He had no regard for Cain's offering. You're bringing me junk. So Cain became very angry. Why did Cain become angry? Well, he was prideful. I'm the firstborn. Why should I have to go to my brother for a, for a sacrificial animal? Why should I have to trade my fruits for that animal? Here, just take the fruits, Lord. Why do I have to go through my brothers, my intermediary? Say it, somebody for me, intermediary. Why? Why do I have to go through my brother Abel 
to come to you. I'll just give you my fruit. Why do we have to go through the shed blood of Jesus Christ to get to God anyways? I'm angry. I don't want to go through Jesus to get to, to, get to heaven. Why do I want to do that? I'll just do it on my own. <laughs> you see that? That's pride. That's jealousy. That's him sitting on his own throne. That's him making himself equal to God. That's him saying, God, I got a better plan. You ever said, God, I got a better plan? How many times a day have you said, God, I got a better plan? 1 John 3, verse 11. For this is the message which you have heard from the beginning. From the beginning. When's the beginning? The beginning. In the beginning, God created. As you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of the evil one, and slew his brother. And for what reason did he slay him? Watch this. Because his deeds were evil, and his brothers were righteous. Cain's deeds were evil, his brothers were righteous. Cain had evil in his heart. I don't want to have to do it, you, do it your way, God. I want you to accept it my way. Do not be surprised, brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. That's what God says about Cain and Abel. That's what John says about Cain and Abel. Nothing's changed. Why do we have fellowship here? Why is this called a fellowship Bible church? Because fellowship, loving your brethren, loving your neighbor as yourself, loving one another, being transparent with one another, the love of the brethren is so important for our life. For us to live together with just the love to one another is so amazing. Don't you look forward to coming here and visiting with your brethren? Don't you look forward to coming in here and, and being able to have a joy and a smile on your face and saying, man, I, just, I don't have to deal with the junk of this world. I can go just spend some time with some people that I know are like-minded. And I can start my week out with a joy and a hope and all that crud that I just, just attacked me all week long. I can just leave in the parking lot. I had to bring it in here because I know these people here. I can be transparent with them. Now, Cain, Cain became angry and his countenance fell. He had a old sad look on his face. <sighs> God didn't like my offering. He became angry. Then the Lord said to Cain, watch this, God isn't giving up on Cain. God doesn't give up on people. God says, hey, wait a second. You can be redeemed. You can be restored. Let me help you restore you. Let me help you with restoration here. Let me help you. He said to Cain, why are you angry? God knows your heart. He's offering redemption here. And why is your continence falling? Why are you looking old sad? Why you got that old sour puss look on your face? You're not getting your due, are you? You're not getting your way. Your feelings are hurt. Your feelings are hurt because you're not who you think you are. Your pride and your jealousy has gotten in the way, King. This is the first of gospel appeals that you'll see that God gives you. If you do well, if you do what I command, if you do the things that I say, if you just live a life the way I've created you to live, if you live that life, if you just do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? Will you not feel good? Let me ask you a question. When you feel God moving in your life, when you feel the joy of the Lord in you, you are like, woo, this is great. I'm having fun. It doesn't matter that all the things bad around me happening. I have the Lord and I take my joy in the Lord and I take my hope in the Lord and I remain in the Lord. I don't let the worries of everyday life just choke me out. I take what God has given me and I enjoy it. And I live by that. I enjoy the love and life that God's given me. I'm going to walk by faith. He says, won't your countenance be lifted up? But if you do not do well, sin, sin is crouching at your door. If you allow your emotions to rule your life, sin is crouching at your door. If you live by your emotions, sin is crouching at your door because you've taken what God's... Listen, God has created you to look outward at things and not inward at yourself. Listen, God's created you to not be self-centered not to think of yourself only. Not to be self-righteous. That you're to die to yourself. 
So what he's saying is if you don't rule your life based on how you feel, knowledge of good and evil, on how you feel, but you live your life based on the faith that I've given, that God has put in you, if you live your life based on the faith that God calls you to have, you're, you're good to go. But if not, the sin is crouching at your door, and it's desires for you. But you must master it. It's desires for you. Sin wants to consume you. It wants to take you down and eat you and bring you down and just crush you to nothing. That's what sin wants. Sin doesn't have your best interests at heart. Sin doesn't love you. Sin doesn't have any uh, good plans for you. Sin just wants to consume you because it wants you to be separated from God. Because if sin can separate you from God, the devil's won. No, God just wants you to return to Him. He wants you to keep your heart turned towards Him. He doesn't want you to be consumed in how you feel about something. He wants you to be consumed in what He knows about you and how He knows you and the faith you have in Him. Watch this. God doesn't want you to be self-sufficient. He wants you to be faithful. His desires for you, Satan's desires for you, but you must master it. You must be strong and courageous. Be faithful. You must rule over your emotions. I have this hat that says, Faith is fear's kryptonite. My faith will destroy fear every time. But I have to have faith to destroy my fears. Verse 8, Cain told Abel his brother, what did Cain tell Abel, his brother? Everything we just talked about. Well, oh, God didn't like my sacrifice. God didn't like what I brought to the altar, Abel. He liked yours much better, but he didn't like mine. Ah, it just makes me so angry, so mad. I'm sure Abel said, Brother, here, take, take one of my flock and go. T take it back. Here, go. Oh, God, he's a meanie. He just don't like me. And it came about, watch this, when they were in the field. It came about when they were in the field. So Abel, he's not thinking Cain's going to do anything to him. They're in the field together. They're working. It came about in their field that Cain rose up against him. Cain plotted against his brother Abel because he allowed the fear, he allowed sin to master him. He allowed his anger, his jealousy, his own self-interest desires to fester into murdering his brother. Sin will take you further than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. That's the sin of sight of us. But thanks be to Jesus Christ, who through his shed blood, we are saved. Amen. Listen, this is in the first three chapters, now four chapters and eight verses of Genesis that we've learned everything we need to know about who God is, why He would create the heavens and earth, and what His purpose is for you in life. That's how important our book of Genesis is. It's the book of beginnings. It's the book of the new creation. It's the book of new life. It's the book written to you so that you can know your personal Savior, the personal God, the one who created you because He loves you. The one that loves you so much that even though you're fallen, even though you have bouts of self-centeredness and self-seeking things, even though you have bouts of, of saying, I got this God, He still loves you, still provides you that way back to your flaming sword, those cherubim into the gates of heaven. What a wonderful God. What a beautiful God. Let me pray for this. We're honored that you've joined us this morning. If you would like to visit us in person, Sunday service begins at 1030 a.m. For more information, visit us at msfbc.net. The Mountain Springs Fellowship Bible Church is a fellowship of believers who are caring and committed through our walk with Christ. Our purpose is to share Jesus Christ and Him crucified, to be a uniting light in the pasture God gave us purpose over and cultivate hope and joy and faith through the love of God and the Spirit in us. When you accept Jesus into your life, God pours His righteousness into you.